the McKinsey problem-solving test has become irrelevant. In 2019, McKinsey replaced it with the problem-solving game, or PSG, and this new gamified test has gathered all the attention from consulting applicants recently. It's unpredictable and impossible to game, pun intended. McKinsey themselves said candidates do not need to prepare for the PSG because they would not be able to prepare anyway. Well, I don't think so. Hi, my name is Kim Tran, a former McKinsey consultant and the founder of mconsultingprep.com. Ten years ago, we developed the first and only system to break down the test by question types and give candidates a significant boost in pass rate. This time, let's crack the problem-solving game. This is a big video. Please make the best use of the timestamp to jump to the content suitable to you. Part 1. What is the PSG? PSG stands for Problem Solving Game. It is a gamified test created by a company called Embellus for McKinsey as a replacement for its proprietary Problem Solving Test, or PST for short. It is a collection of video games intended to measure the consulting traits and qualifications of a candidate, then compare them to those of a real McKinsey consultant. If you appear similar, or even better than the model consultant, you would be given a pass. There are a few different names for this game. Problem Solving Game, or PSG, Imbalus Game, or Digital Assessment, but they all refer to the same thing. The gamified nature of the new PSG points to a fundamentally different assessment process from the traditional PST. How? 1. The PSG is a computer-based gamified test, while the PST was a paper-based standardized test. 2. This difference also enabled the PSG to be taken at home compared to the PST which had to be conducted at designated test sites. This has become quite convenient these days when social distancing is the norm. 3. The PSG supposedly allows McKinsey to rule out the bias caused by the familiarity of some candidates with standardized tests such as the GMAT or GRE, enabling them to test candidates from all kinds of backgrounds equally. But in fact, I think the PSG highly favors those of the history of playing strategy video games instead. Four, the assessment mechanisms not only measure the final product of each candidate, as with the PSG, but also the process of how candidates arrive at that product. It tracks every behavior of the candidate to grade them using dozens of different criteria. This is where the PST falls short because it cannot tell apart candidates with different traits as long as they have the same results. In these regards, the PSG is quite similar to other gamified tests. However, with that said, the PSG is still a test. Instead of relying on arcade-style games similar to Angry Birds, Penguin Diner, or Simple Maze games, as with many other gamified assessments out there, the unique requirements of McKinsey lead to the use of puzzle and strategy games with highly complex mechanisms, overwhelming data, and uncertainties. In fact, McKinsey official guidelines implied that you need a scratch paper to play the PSG, just like you do with a test. You'd actually spend more time planning and calculating on that scratch paper than actually playing the game on the computer screen. Part 2, the mini-games of the PSG. The PSG is made of two mini-games called Ecosystem Placement and Invasive Species. For the sake of better reflecting the objectives of these games and for better synergy with other, other literature, I'll call them Ecosystem Building and Plant Defense. These two mini-games can be categorized into the puzzle genre, with perhaps a slight blend of strategy games. They all rely on the candidate drawing effective plans and making correct calculations, pure brain exercises. There are a few reports of other alternative mini-games entering their beta testing at different times as well. But at the time of this video, summer 2021, we don't have to worry about those yet. If there is news, the PSG Mega article on our website will be the best place to stay updated. Link is in the description. Both mini-games are currently played within a hard total time limit of 71 minutes. Over the years, there have been reports of this hard limit being between 60 and 80 minutes, usually depending on the mini-game that is played. You are free to allocate your time however you like. McKinsey recommends 35 minutes for the ecosystem building mini-game and 36 minutes for the plant defense. Playing the first mini-game quickly, and you'll have more time for the second, and vice versa. According to the field reports and beta testers of our PSG simulation, yes, we developed a practice mock PSG with 95% similarity, time is relatively comfortable compared to the PSD if you have a structured approach. Of course, you will still be focused and make the most out of every minute playing the game, but time will not be the issue, especially after some practice. 
part 2.1, mini game number one, ecosystem building. In ecosystem building, the player objective is to create a sustainable ecosystem, which basically consists of two big steps. One, build a food chain of eight species with sustainable calories input and output using a given base of 39 species. Place that food chain in a location with a suitable living condition. The game will randomly assign you to a mountain or a coral reef environment. The appearances might differ, but all the important bits really stay the same, so don't worry about that. Now let's walk through the interface of the game. These screen captures not from the real game, McKinsey would know about it if you attempt to illegally take a screenshot. The footage demonstrated in this video is from the PSG simulation, the mock game that we developed. On the left hand side of the screen you'll be given a guidebook window with an instruction and species tab. The instruction tab is pretty much self-explanatory. Just remember to always read the instructions, even if you have to read it 100 times in practice. There's always a slight chance a small aspect of the game is updated right at the time you take it. You'll not want to put $100,000 a year offer at risk with the wrong assumption. Under the Species tab is the database from which you will view and choose your species. There are 39 species divided into 9 producers and 30 animals. As the name suggests, producers are species that don't eat others, but they do act as the food, or in other words, the calorie source for others. Producers are plants, fungi, and corals, while most animals are well, animals of various sizes and shapes, from plant-eating animals to top predators. This little arrow button allows you to open the Species tab to see detailed data points. The first and second will tell you about the amount of calories it needs and the calories it provides. The third and fourth is about its desirable living conditions. The fifth and sixth about the species that eat it and the species that it eats. And if the seventh and eighth data points are present, they're usually about the desirable living conditions as with the third and the fourth. So eight data points for 39 species, we have 312 data points to deal with. If this is not hard enough, McKinsey puts an obstacle here by only allowing you to view 8 to 12 data points at a time. If all of the data is neatly placed on an Excel spreadsheet, you can see almost everything, and the game would be significantly easier. But we don't live in a perfect world. And in the real world, McKinsey consultants also have to deal with lots of volume, messy data, all the time. This ecosystem minigame replicates that aspect of a consultant's work very well. Moving on to the right hand side of the screen, you will see a monitors or conditions panel. This contains seven or eight data points on the living conditions of the chosen location. You need the data to know if your species can live in a given location. When you hover or click on any point of the map, the living conditions for that specific location will be displayed. McKinsey puts another obstacle here. You can only choose to view at most four data points at the same time. So if you want to view all seven or eight living conditions for one location, the time to perform that action effectively doubles. That's because you have to tick the first four conditions, choose the location, note down the number, untick those four conditions, then repeat the process for the remaining three. It's really tedious. Remember that the main task is to build a food chain where every species has one, enough food to eat, and two, suitable conditions to live in. Every time the living conditions don't match, or a species is not given the right food source, or not enough food, or does not provide enough food for its predator, the system fails. And the story does not end there. The species in your food chain don't just eat and get eaten in a random manner, they follow a very strict set of rules, which themselves are difficult to comprehend in a high pressure test setting. Here's how it goes. Don't worry if this overwhelms you at first, by the way. It does that to everybody. We'll walk you through an example right after and everything will make sense. Number one, the species with the highest calories provided eats first. It eats its food source with the highest calories provided. In the case of a tie, it eats equally from both sources. Number two, when a food source is eaten, its calories provided decreases permanently by an amount equal to the eating species' calories needed. If the eating species needs more calories, it eats the next food source with the highest calories provided at that point. It will keep eating until all calories needed are met or all the food sources have been exhausted. Number three, then the species with the next highest current calories provided eats. The same process repeats itself. Number four, at the end when all species have eaten, the surviving species are those with A, positive net calories provided, and B, calories needed fully met. Let's look at an example of a hypothetical food chain. And in this example, I will also demonstrate the note-taking method that you can use to organize data neatly in your notes. You're welcome to pause the video and try to solve this on your own first. Try to figure out which species will live and which will die in the end. Here's how the food chain plays out with the first three eating rules. The three producers at the bottom automatically have their calories needed satisfied and do not need to eat anything. 
Beside the three producers, the first species to eat is an animal, the mouse, because it produces the most calories, 3,000. It takes calories equally from grass and mushroom, which have equal calories provided of 5,000 each. The mouse needs 4,000 calories, so it takes 2,000 from each. The mouse's calories needed is reduced to zero, while the calories provided for grass and mushrooms are reduced to 3,000 each. The next species to eat is the squirrel, with 2,500 calories provided. It should have eaten grass, but grass's new calories provided is only 3,000, so the squirrel picks nuts instead. Squirrel's calories needed comes down to zero, while nuts' calories needed becomes 500. The next to eat is the snake, with 1,500 calories provided, most in the field at the moment. It eats the mouse, reducing its own calories needed to zero, while taking 2,000 from the 3,000 of the mouse's calories provided. Then comes the fox, with 1,200 calories provided. It eats the squirrel, reducing its own calories needed to zero, while taking 2,000 from the 2,500 of the squirrel's calories provided. The last species to eat is the tiger. It eats the snake first, taking away all of the snake's 1,500 calories provided, then proceeds to take 500 from the fox's 1,200 so that its calories needed can be reduced to zero. The tiger is not eaten by any other animal. Applying the fourth eating rule reveals that the snake dies out from overconsumption by the tiger. In a real PSG session, you will need to find a replacement for the snake, which often requires you to change a few other species as well. Sometimes you may change the whole ecosystem if time allows. Otherwise, you have to submit a suboptimal ecosystem, which will surely compromise your chances. For the scope of this video, without overcomplicating things, let me share you with you some simple tips for this ecosystem minigame. Apply these, and with practice, you'll soon be mastering the game. For more advanced tips, look up to our website at the link below. Tip 1. Filter Noise Among over 312 data points presented in this minigame, fewer than 100 are actually relevant. Study the game hard and find out beforehand which data points you can ignore and which you have to pay attention to. For example, out of 7 to 8 living condition metrics, you only need to care about the depth and elevation and temperature. Others are just noise there to distract you. Tip 2. Develop and follow a structured process. Do not pick your species in a random order, bottom up from the producers or top down from the apex predators. Either way is fine, but always have a structure in your mind. Tip 3. Take notes. Don't just calculate in your head and play on the screen. The main battle is fought on the scratch paper in front of you. Everything you do on the screen can be and will be used as evidence against you in a court of law. The scratch paper is your good old lawyer. Use it. We created a note template in the description, and you can take advantage of that. Part 2.2, minigame number 2, Plant Defense. This minigame is essentially a tower defense game consisting of three rounds, officially called maps. Each map is a complete and independent round, so if you do poorly on the first one, you still have a chance to start over with a clean slate for the second one. The recommended time for each round is 12 minutes, so 36 in total. You can allocate your time however you want. Each map often comes with a square grid playing field of 10x10 or 12x12. Somewhere in the middle, you have a base, represented in-game by a native plant, and your job is to arrange resources to help defend that plant against invaders. The game is turn-based, so you make a move, then the computer makes another move. Then back to your turn. This aspect of the game is somewhat similar to chess. The difference is that in chess, both opponents play an indefinite number of turns until one player wins. In this game, you can only play a maximum of 15 turns. Then, the computer can make indefinite consecutive turns until your base is invaded, so you will always lose in this plant defense minigame. Your objective is to delay that for as long as possible. Most new players will be taken out even before the 15 turn mark, but I've seen testers of our PSG simulation product making it to 40 or even 50 turns. No matter how good your process score is, if you lose in the 14th turn, you will lose the offer to the one making it in 50 turns. The invaders in this game are real-life invasive species such as fox, mice, or groundhogs. They appear randomly from the borders of the map every three to four turns and move one square per turn toward your base. They come in stacks, occupying one square each with a population that acts too similar to health points in other games. To delay and destroy these invaders, you'd use resources called defenders and terrain transformations, or just terrains as I usually call them. Defenders are predators such as wolves, snakes, or falcons, which in this game would act as towers to defend the base, by taking away the population from invaders that get into their range. 
Each defender has its own range and damage, but generally the weaker defenders have longer ranges and the stronger defenders have shorter ranges. Terrains such as rocks, forests, and cliffs, on the other hand, do not kill invaders, but act as obstacles to invaders. Some terrains such as cliffs force invaders to change paths, while others such as rocks and forests slow them down. The way you play each turn is not totally straightforward. Instead of making each move at the time, the game requires you to plan five turns at the time. Of course, you can adjust the plan along the way, so the logic is just like other normal turn-based games. Here's how the game interface works. Hover on each of the defenders or terrain to see the full specs. Some important data points to notice are the attack, the range, the availability, and the compatibility, meaning where you can place them. To plan a turn, you can click on the defender or terrain choice, then click on a point on the map where you want to place it. The map will show a visual cue of where you can place it based on the rule and specs of your selected defender or terrain. Once placed on the map, the cyan shaded squares show you the attack area of that defender. Do that five times to fully plan five turns. The tracker for your turns and your selected actions is shown here in the bottom center of the screen. Only after completing the five turn plan, you can play the scenario by clicking on the run plan button. You have to keep clicking that button, which now becomes next turn each time for the computer to take a turn. Defenders and terrains you place for each turn will only start to take effect or activate when their turn comes. Once activated, the cyan shaded squares around the fenders will become purple. Notice the yellow glow around the turn you are about to execute. That tells you where you are in the process. You can also see the turn count here in the status bar right above. This data, however, tells you how many turns have been fully completed. To modify the plan, click on the Edit Plan button, then erase the move you planned by clicking on the little X button on each move. You can only change the moves that haven't been executed. When an invader appears, you will see its trajectory represented by a yellow line. Once shown, you can be assured that the path is fixed regardless of how you make your move. The only exception is when you place a cliff to block the path. When that happens, the invader will change the path, but it always chooses the shortest path that is most similar to the original path, so it's quite predictable. The population of the invader is always shown right beneath it. Here are some more detailed rules making the game more challenging. The first one is that the invaders will come from all directions. In most tower defense games, you only have to deal with just a few possible starting points. In this plant defense minigame, it's literally dozens of possible starting points for invaders. Remember, invaders appear from any border square on the map, and on each map, there are at least 36 such squares. Then, just place dozens of defenders and trains across the map, right? No, not so easy. Here's the second twist. There are limits to how many defenders and terrains you can use, and you cannot just place them wherever and whenever you want. Each of the 15 defenders and terrains has to be assigned to one specific turn, and only takes effect from that turn onward. So, for example, at turn 5, there's an invader stack only two squares away from your base. You place a wolf between the base and the invader stack to kill it, but assigns that wolf to turn 9. The invader stack will just pass right through to your base without any resistance. And as I briefly mentioned before, each defender and terrain all have specific rules of placement. Most often, terrain can only be placed next to an existing terrain of the same type, and defenders must always be placed in certain types of terrain. So in the example before, if, say, the wolf must be placed on a forest square, there is no forest near the base, you would not be able to place the wolf in time to kill the invader stack then let's just shift the resources from place to place, adapting to incoming invader threats, maybe? Remember when we talked about this earlier, once a resource has been activated, that is, it is assigned, a turn has come up, and it has started to take effect, it can no longer be removed, replaced, nor can you change its position. Plus, you also have to make plans to defend the future invaders that have not appeared yet. Unpredictable risks, limited resources, restricting circumstances. That's the PSG for you. We can literally write a whole book on strategy to tackle this game alone. There's so many formulations and formations and tactics you can apply to maximize the survival length. You'll get to read a version of that in the PSG simulation package. In the limited scope of this video, here are a few tips to get you started. Tip 1. Overlap your defenses. This is one of the few cases where being messy has a disadvantage. The more your defenders and terrain overlap, the more damage they cause to invaders, and the less likely your base will be taken. Tip 2. Place your defenders near the base. The logic for this is simple. Think of your defense as a ring. The closer it is to the center base, the smaller it needs to be. Smaller rings mean you can cover the whole circumference more easily and have more overlap. Tip 3. See the big picture. Don't get tunnel vision and look at immediate invaders only at the moment. 
Plan for the long term and future invaders as well. Remember, you still have the objective of surviving as long as possible. Part 3. Let me take advantage of this opportunity to clear up some of the most frequently asked questions regarding the PSG. Question 1. Is the McKinsey PSG available on iOS or Android? No, at least not yet. For now, the PSG, both the real McKinsey ones and our simulation, is available only on desktop. Both Mac and Windows are okay. Question 2. Are there any requirements for the equipment? All you need is just a decent computer, which you most likely already have. A $300 office laptop will do just fine. There's no need to spend $1,500 on a Lenovo ThinkPad just to take this PSG. With that said, there are a few recommendations to help your test go smoothly. Get a high-spec computer and fast broadband internet. The PSG is pretty hefty for a web-based game with all its fancy graphics and animations. In fact, if your internet and hardware is too slow, you won't pass the initial system check and won't be allowed to take the PSG. If you don't have such a computer, try to borrow one from your family or friends. Look for a computer with high resolution, preferably HD or more, then set low screen scaling, 100%. This will allow more data to be shown on the screen at the same time. This is hugely beneficial. The biggest challenge of the ecosystem minigame is how to cope with a messy and large volume of data. If you're the kind of person who uses 125 to 150% cent scaling because you have bad eyes or prefer big letters like me, well, time to get out of our comfort zone. And don't worry, the ordeal will last just an hour. If you don't have a mouse, buy one. The cheapest mouse would serve just as well as the best. All actions in the game are done by clicking, so having a mouse instead of a touchpad will vastly speed up your game and leave more time for the calculations. Question 3. Who will be invited to take the test and how do they use the results? The PSG is used to screen a wide range of candidates for various positions, not just the traditional consulting track. The grading mechanism, especially the process score part, will be slightly different for different positions. You will only be informed about the final result. Two simple words, pass or fail. No explanation, no component score, no nothing. Question 4. I made a mistake during the test. Will I still pass? This is like missing one question in the PST. Of course, if you do well in the other parts, you'll still make it. With that said, given that the process score can be unpredictable, I believe we should strive to be perfect on the product score. It's totally possible to do so if you strictly follow my methodology. Why do you want to leave some achievable points on the table? Question 5. I switched between this and that X number of times. I swapped Y species from the food chain, etc. Would I still pass? Don't worry about the algorithms tracking your behavior. Focus on the game's objectives and approach them in a careful, structured, tactical manner like I show you. If the algorithms are as smart as they are said to be, they should know that we are tackling the game exactly like a consultant would do it. Question 6. Should I use paper notes or Excel sheets to take notes? Use whatever feels right and convenient for you. Personally, I'm more comfortable with paper notes because I write fast and I don't need to switch windows to view my notes. The downside is that correcting mistakes is a bit clumsy and the note can not do calculations by itself. I have heard of candidates using two laptops side by side to take this test with one for note taking using Excel. So try a few practices for yourself and see what works best for you. Question 7. Are those real screenshots from the PSG? Nobody is allowed to take real screenshots from the PST. The footage you see in this video is from our premium product, M Consulting Prep's PSG Simulation. It's a practice platform designed to help candidates familiarize themselves with the interface, try out strategies, and hone their problem-solving skills for the PSG, built using the most up-to-date reports and feedback. It also comes with a detailed manual showing step-by-step approaches as well as common mistakes, potential pitfalls, and how to avoid them. Over the past two years, thanks to many of you, my dear followers, I have been piecing the game one by one from 125 field reports and counting. Whenever I can, I jump on a Zoom call with the test takers just minutes after they complete their PSG. I was able to get super fresh perspectives, how the screen looks, what each button does, how each aspect of the game logic works, how the invaders move, how the game generates its data or makes its maps, etc. In the process, I also intentionally made the PSG simulation a little broader than the real one. This allows users to practice multiple times with endless scenarios while improving a combo of different skills on top of all the quick tricks to hack the game. So even in a rare but possible event of McKinsey updating the game exactly at the time you take it, you'll still ace it with grace. Visit the M Consulting Prep website for more information. You can find the link in the description. I hope this FAQ session and this video have resolved some of the most pressing questions about the PSG for you guys. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave a comment and I will personally answer each. If you are about to take the test and are willing to contribute field reports in exchange for partial access to our PSG simulation, you can message us on Facebook or send an email to support at mconsultingprep.com. At M Consulting Prep, we believe anyone can game. Are you a believer?